Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to see everyone here. The museum is crazy crowded today. I love it. Love it. Um, I'm Gloria Groom. I'm the chair and the David and Mary Whitten Green curator in the Department of European uh, Painting and Sculpture of Europe. Such a mouthful. And I'm delighted to welcome you here for the first program, second program actually, for the exhibition which opened yesterday, Van Gogh and the Avant-Garde, the Modern Landscape. So before we begin, please silence your um, noisemakers. And um, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the stars of today's program, Jacqueline Coutre and Jenna Carvana. Jacqueline N. Coutre is the Eleanor Wood Prince Associate Curator in Painting and Painting and Sculpture of Europe and is a specialist in the Rembrandt and his circle. She arrived at the Art Institute in fall of 2019, just before you know what. And when we were allowed back in, she wasted no time. And in 2021, she headed the reinstallation of the galleries for 17th century Dutch and Flemish paintings, which she completely transformed with new interpretive texts and digital labels and a number of important acquisitions, including a floral still life by a woman artist, Maria Alsterbink. Uh, Jacqueline received her master's and PhD in art history at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University with a specialization in early modern Northern European painting and a dissertation on Rem Rembrandt's colleague and competitor, Jan Levens. Prior to her time in Chicago, she was the beta curator and researcher of European art at the Agnes Etherington Art Center at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. There she curated the traveling exhibition, Leiden, circa 1630, Rembrandt Emerges. In addition to her numerous research fellowships, she has held positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Gallery of Art, and the Indianapolis Museum of Art. But today, we are celebrating Dr. Coutre's most recent achievement as curator of the exhibition, Van Gogh and the Avant-Garde. Joining Jacqueline today is Jenna K. Carvana, curatorial associate in the Department of Painting and Sculpture, our department, where she has provided invaluable research support and uh, authored the extensive chronology, which I hope you'll read in the catalog that I know you'll be buying, and in the installation of the exhibition itself. As many of you, I hope, will remember she the exhibition El Greco, um, ambition and Defiance, which literally opened a week before we were shut down. Um, Jenna was also the research associate and very involved in that exhibition as well. She has a Master of Arts degree in Medieval History from the University of Leeds in UK, and she's held collection and curatorial positions at the Royal Armouries Leeds, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Museum of Science and Industry. We were fortunate that our own collection of arms and armor enticed her to come here, and from there she has come to our department, Painting and Sculpture of Europe, um, where she has literally become the in-house expert on all things provenance related. And as you'll hear today, she is a vital member of the curatorial team. So now, I welcome to the podium, or to the stage, Jacqueline and Jenna. Um, it will come as a bit as a, of a surprise, I imagine, that um, the kernel of the exhibition that begins with the words Van Gogh and the avant-garde actually is not a Van Gogh painting. It is the painting that you see on the screen, the Ponton de la Félicité by Paul Signac. This work was acquired in 2016 by the Van Gogh Museum. And its pertinence to Van Gogh is the fact that it was shown in the third exhibition of the Artistes Indépendants, kind of a counter salon exhibition um, in 1887 in the spring. And we're quite sure that Van Gogh himself attended the exhibition, saw this painting, and uh, fairly soon thereafter, perhaps even a matter of days, went out to the northwestern suburbs of Paris to paint. We know that he was in Onier, in on the ground shot, uh, was at Clichy, 
all of these suburbs in the immediate vicinity of Paris. So this is where the exhibition begins. And really, uh, the exhibition seeks to answer several questions, but one of which is, um, how does an artist go from working in this dark, earthy palette with um, visible and embossed brush strokes, as you see on the left, around 1885, to the Van Gogh that we so think of from his period in uh, Arles, that is swirling brush strokes, luminous and very expressive color. And that's just four years later. We think it is these three months in the suburbs of Paris, um, of which you see on the screen our beautiful fishing in spring, which is a highlight of the exhibition. Um, it is in this period that the artist not only meets other artists who are working with very avant-garde techniques, but he begins to explore landscape that is evolving and changing, that is both uh, one that captures industry but also leisure, and the artist himself wrote that he was very stimulated by these tensions, that the contrast between city and countryside really stimulated his creativity. And he even, in one of his letters, referred to the impact that this experience, these three months in 1887, had on his production. In 1887, he wrote, and when I painted landscape in Onyer the summer, I saw more color in it than before. So this is a moment of awakening to color, and that is the fundamental thing, I would say, that we think about when we think of Van Gogh. The artist uh, arrived in Paris in 1886, just a few years after deciding that he wanted to become an artist. Um, Van Gogh, like some of us, took a while to find his way. Uh, he tried, <laughs> he tried uh, uh, out uh, working for an art dealer. He was going to study to be a preacher. Neither of those really suited. And so around 1881, he decided to become an artist. Um, he spent some time working in the Netherlands, uh, moved to Belgium, Antwerp in particular, where he enrolled briefly at an academy. Um, and then unexpectedly showed up on his brother Theo's front door in Paris in late February 1886. And he enrolled in the studio of Fernand Cormand, an, an artist we'll come back to in a moment. Um, quickly quick, quit that uh, academy as well. And just dug in deep into the avant-garde uh, scene in Paris. And that is what led him to these northwestern suburbs, um, which we are love to highlight in this exhibition. But of course, we should note that Van Gogh was not working in a vacuum. There are other artists in this exhibition that um, he knew very well and exhibited with, uh, interacted with very heavily. And we'd like to take a moment to introduce them as well. So the first is an artist I'm sure familiar to many of you in the audience, Georges Seurat. Um, he trained formally, went to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and around 1881 uh, began to take trips out to the Grand Jatte. Again, a sight familiar to many of you, I'm sure. Um, and about the same time is when he begins reading color theory, Michel Eugène Chevreuil, Ogden Rood, and I think kind of the primary idea that he takes from these color theories is that of optical mixing, where if you place two complementary colors next to each other on the canvas and allow them to mix in your eye, there is a more vibrant color created than actually mixing those two colors to create a third color on your palette. Did I get that right? Sounds right to me. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> So Seurat is very much, um, <clears throat> if you will, kind of the, the leader of this avant-garde group with these color theories, with the changes he makes to his brushstroke. Um, and his Grand Jatte, Sunday on the Grand Jatte, 1884, really, I think, one of the touchstones of this moment is on view in Gallery 240. Our next artist, Paul Signac, moved to Onyer with his family at the age of 16 in 1880. 
1880, his father passes away and the family business is sold, but this gives Signac the independent financial means to quit school um, and after a brief stint as a writer to pursue a career as a painter. I like to note that Signac was entirely self-taught, but by 1884, he's admitting works to the Paris Salon, um, very much like Seurat is doing as well. Um, but like Seurat, his works are rejected by the admissions committee. This ends up being a positive for him, I should say, uh, because it's this rejection that leads to his participation with the independence uh, and allows him to meet Seurat, who would have a monumental impact on the young Signac's career. I should note that while Seurat is certainly credited for developing the divisionist technique and really employing that optical mixing phenomenon in his works, it was Signac who was much more outgoing <laughs> compared to the older artist, um, uh, who really marketed this technique. Uh, he developed sort of an international circle of artists, critics, and dealers who really helped uh, continue and support this technique. And Jenna, having worked with you on this project for several years, um, I know that you developed a particular affinity for Signac. Could you tell us a little about that? What about him so appealed? Yeah, I was first introduced to his works in 2019 at an exhibition that showed some of his later works. And I was very drawn to his use of color, how vibrant they were. It was just very invigorating uh, to me. So working on this project, learning a bit more about him that he is self-taught, as I mentioned, and sort of seeing that progression in the works that we display, the earliest uh, being 1882, around the beginning of his artistic career, and the latest 1900, after he's already gone to explore the Mediterranean. We see him sort of absorbing what the Impressionists are doing, but then gradually starting to pick up the color theories and the influence of Seurat, but then interpreting uh, those influences as an, in his own way, which for me is a really nice, uh, a nice thing to see throughout. Great, thank you. Our next artist is Emile Bernard, uh, who, like uh, Signac, moved to the northwestern suburbs of Paris at the age of 16 in the year 1884. Although his parents did not approve, he desperately wanted to be a painter. So somehow he convinces them to allow him to enroll in Fernand Cormont's studio. And it's here a few years later that he very briefly meets Van Gogh before getting expelled. <laughs> Now, Bernard was expelled for painting a background in a bright uh, green and a red-orange color, and when asked, rather than the typical gray-brown, I should note, and when asked why he painted it that way, he said, I just saw it like that, to which Cormand replied something along the lines of, well, you can go see it that way somewhere else. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's my favorite, really. <laughs> this did not deter him. Uh, and we see during the 1880s, Bernard really picking up and abandoning different styles, which leads to his participation in the development of a technique or a style called cloisonism, which we see uh, shown here on the screen, a perfect example uh, in his Iron Bridges at Onier. This style is inspired by a type of metalwork, but also by influenced a little bit by Japanese woodblock prints which he, uh, Bernard is introduced to by Van Gogh. Uh, and this style is really defined by um, solid forms of, of solid flat forms of relatively pure color outlined with thick, dark outlines. And last but not least, we have Charles Langrand. Langrand trained as an artist, but he made a living as a teacher. Uh, and moved to Paris to teach math at a secondary school in 1882. He's only really working in Paris and uh, the suburbs while school is in session. During the holidays, he travels to North to back to his family home in northern France. So there's very little time throughout the year and over the years that he's really working in this particular area. And he only really discovers the northwestern suburbs in 1885, a few years after he moves to Paris. So we don't have a lot of works uh, in his general oeuvre of um, that depict this region. So we're very happy to sort of introduce him to our audiences at the Art Institute. So I know we touched on why my interest in Seurat and what draws me to him. What artist most appeals to you, Jacqueline? 
Well, I have to say I found Angron to be fascinating. Um, He's probably unfamiliar to many of you. He was unfamiliar to me. As Jenna alluded to, um, he only made a handful, six paintings in these northwestern suburbs, and his entire oeuvre is only about 100 paintings, probably about 100 drawings as well. Um, but he is a fascinating character because he, in a way, is the most successful, conventionally speaking, of these five. Um, he shows with uh, the... Uh, Indépendant, that anti-salon that I mentioned earlier, but he's also showing with the most established art dealers, the dealer um, Georges Petit, who was part of the dealers of the Grand Boulevard in Paris. Um, these were the dealers who were selling the work of the Impressionists, and these were the artists who were looking to do something new, go beyond what the Impressionists were doing. And El Grand somehow negotiated both worlds, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, so now that we've introduced the five artists, shall we talk a bit about some of the highlights of the exhibition? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important to first and foremost begin with Van Gogh's cliché triptych, which includes our very own fishing in spring. When we think of Van Gogh, we don't usually think of him working in the triptych format, and indeed this is very much his first exploration of this format. We know that there was an inventory taken after uh, his death that notes three triptychs total painted during this time, that of Clichy, Onier, and the Grand Jatte. But unfortunately, the inventory omits the titles of the works or dimensions that help to identify them. <laughs> Our assembly of the triptychs is based on the most recent scholarship. We know for for instance, that Van Gogh would paint the red borders onto the canvas before heading out to work on plein air, outdoors, uh, in situ. Um, so it's really exciting to see, to bring these works together and to see how Van Gogh interpreted each location. Clichy, for example, uh, even at that time had a reputation for being very industrial, more of a place of business than of leisure and relaxation. But I think uh, the examples uh, of the cliche triptych that you see on the screen really shows this area in a different light. Um, we are delighted to present the design for the town hall at all on year by Paul Signac. Um, this design has never been shown in the U.S., and we're thrilled to have it here. Um, and in a way, this is a bit of a coda to the whole exhibition. Um, in 1900, the Town Hall at Onier uh, organized a competition to decorate its reception room. And there was a large call put out. Over 100 artists, 114, I think, uh, submitted proposals including Paul Signac, who, as Jan Jenna just mentioned, was really familiar with this terrain, having grown up there, having painted there for years. And though he had spent the previous 10 years in the Mediterranean and Saint-Tropez and various areas, he was quite keen to come back and re-engage with um, these suburbs. And he was an established artist at this point, highly well-respected. Of the 114 candidates, Paul Signac was not one of the ones who made the shortlist even. Um, so this was a large swing and a miss on his part, at least according to the committee that organized the competition. Uh, critics adored his uh, designs. They d called them fresh, delicate, brilliant. Um, and in particular, they celebrated the way he combined both the leisure aspects of uh, Onier, visible on the left, yes, I suppose it's the same as you see, as I see on the screen, um, with uh, sailing and rowing, the epitome of the recreational pastimes in this area. And then on the right, the industrial character of the suburb with uh, coal cranes, smokestacks, etc. Um, the artist they actually decided to go with was an artist named Henri Bouvet, who incorporated some of the same motifs, but he certainly toned down the, the amount of smoke, the number of smokestacks, and he emphasized the Seine and made it more of a mirror-like uh, presence as opposed to the beautiful series of dots that we see on uh, in Signac's canvas. So, gets the job done, but slightly more conventional than what Signac was proposing. Um, 
that said, this design looks fantastic on the walls in the exhibition, and um, we hope you will enjoy, enjoy, enjoy it as uh, the first audience to see it here in the US. And then there are a few works that we are reuniting for the first time. Um, we know that Seurat and Engrand were painting together on the island of the Grand Jatte in 1888. And I believe this is the only instance in the exhibition where we know that the two artists were painting side by side. So yep. this is very exciting to present these together. Um, but these works have not been shown since the independent uh, exhibition in 1890. We have the work on the left by Seurat from Brussels, the Engrand on the right from a private collection, and over 100 years later, yeah, if I'm doing my math right, um, we are bringing them together, which is very exciting. Um, and we've talked a bit about the artists, we've talked very briefly about their styles, um, but what about these suburbs? What about Paris during this moment? Paris was certainly in a period of transition at this time. Um, in the 1850s, a large modernization of the city was begun by Louis, Louis Napoleon, and it is the process that gave us the city that we know today, and certainly the city that we know from uh, Caillebotte's Paris Street rainy day. That is, a city with large boulevards, wide sidewalks, streets radiating from open plazas, um, these multi-storied apartment buildings with uniform facades, and the beautiful green spaces that allowed citizens of the city to recreate. Um, such major renovations aren't without consequences, however, and about 350,000 people were displaced to the suburbs outside of the city. So we had a major shift in population. We had increased uh, development in terms of the building of factories in this area. And yet there, things also went the other way. We had the passenger railroad, which was established in 1837, which allowed not only those uh, who were forced to move to the suburbs to commute into the city to work, but Parisians could go out to the suburbs to enjoy the beautiful uh, landscape, to picnic, to sail, um, to attend balls, etc. So the city, in a way, was becoming the new Paris and also was becoming um, a bit more porous in its boundaries. And it's important to point out that these, bound these suburbs were quite close to the city. Um, they are on this map right here within walking distance. And in fact, Van Gogh and Signac, I believe at times, would walk from Paris to these suburbs in order to paint. It could be done in an hour or so. It's only about three miles. Um, just to highlight that these were right on the fringe of the city as opposed to the suburbs that uh, Renoir and Monet were going to 12, 15 miles out, suburbs like Argenteuil, Bougival, et cetera. So even uh, in their choice of location, these artists were trying to set themselves apart from um, their colleagues. If you were to visit these suburbs today, however, they are much different from what Van Gogh and his fellows encountered. So a really valuable resource for us throughout this project have been these po a collection of postcards from around the turn of the century. So here we see a view of Vanier showing the double bridges, the train bridge uh, with a train passing, uh, and then the pedestrian bridge just behind it. We see some factories in the distance and some of the boats as well. Uh, Anier had a reputation as, uh, quote, the holy city of boating, so I'm, I'm glad the boats are <laughs> included here, uh, in addition to these more industrial elements. Uh, many of the factories and buildings that are depicted in uh, the works and even some of the islands as well in the Seine no longer exist. Uh, so this has been a wonderful reference, especially 
in the cases where we're able to compare them directly to the works themselves. So we see here again Bernard's Iron Bridges at Onyer, and it's a fairly faithful representation of the landscape with that cloisonist uh, technique uh, style applied on top. We see essentially the same view of uh, the bridges, slightly closer to the bridges though. We have our boats once again and the train, but again, typical of the style, he's flattening all the shapes and the forms and using large blocks of color and those thick outlines. The exhibition is organized thematically, but there are a few key dates that are important, I think, to organize the experience of the exhibition. And as Gloria mentioned, um, Jenna's timeline is an incredible resource, so don't, I don't think you can miss it, but certainly make sure that you read every entry on it um, on that beautiful dark gray wall in the show. Um, the first one I would like to highlight is the organization of the Société des Artistes Indépendants. Uh, Jenna mentioned the refusal of uh, submissions by Seurat, Signac, and Engrand to the official salon in that year. And they, with numerous other artists, showed in an anti-salon and then created an organization um, that existed well into the 20th century. And um, this is the organization that was dominated by a motto that was very liberating no juries, no prizes. It was, I think, in a way, um, would be called inclusive today. Um, every artist could submit up to 10 works, and they were simply there for the enjoyment of the public without having to undergo the approval or disapproval of an admissions committee. Um, and so this was um, one of the uh, regular salons or, or exhibitions that in which these artists would uh, share their works with the larger public and with each other. I will say this next bit is probably a very familiar story to members of the Art Institute. Um, in 1884, having completed over 70 works on paper and oil studies, Seurat begins work on the Grand Shot in Gallery 240. Only about a year later, in October of 1885, he revisits the work, applying small dots of pure, unmixed pigment directly on top of the existing paint layer. As Jacqueline explained early, earlier, this, um, the strategic placement of these pure tones uh, was intended to mix in the eye of the viewer. So you may have areas that contain blues, purples, greens, yellows, but from a distance, it looks like a peachy skin tone. Um, this technique is called op optical mixing um, and was a key, uh, uh, a key part of Seurat's technique. And indeed, it's these dots that give the style its name. Dots, point, points, pointillism. <laughs> Um, and just a few months later, in February 1886, Van Gogh arrives in Paris. Um, and he is, in a way, another catalyst. Certainly Seurat and the Grand Jatte, always um, a source of inspiration. But Van Gogh, in his inimitable way, um, interjects another label, layer of um, inspiration into this group of artists. Uh, for example, in 1887, he takes Bernard to Samuel Bing's shop to look at Japanese woodcuts, which certainly influenced Clausenism, I would say. Um, and he also organizes a few exhibitions as well. So I think even though Van Gogh was the last artist to go to these suburbs, and he's the oldest of the group, and clearly not a Parisian himself, um, he uh, sparks interest uh, in the key year of 1887. I mentioned earlier that Bernard was expelled from Fernand Cormand's uh, studio, and it's shortly after this expulsion that he begins to experiment with divisionism. Uh, he paints views of Anier and the, the other Parisian suburbs, as well as locations he encounters while traveling throughout France. And in early 1887, he exhibits these works at a small exhibition in Anier, where Paul Signac sees them. Now, Signac, the outgoing proponent of divisionism that he was, was very excited by this and invites Bernard to his studio to see some of his divisionist works. But Bernard goes to the studio and is completely unimpressed. It's at that moment that he decides to completely abandon the style altogether 
um, so much so that it causes a little ten tension between him and uh, and Signac, and he actually refuses to uh, exhibit works in exhibitions where Signac is participating, which he is scolded for uh, by Van Gogh, uh, who thought it was shameful. <laughs> a bit immature, um, maybe. Yeah. A bit Im yeah, immature, I would say. Um, but ultimately, this decision to abandon divisionism in favor of something more experimental, more abstract, leads to the formation or, of Clausenism. And then uh, in about February 1888, Van Gogh leaves Paris. He decides that he is going to search for his own Japan. He was fascinated with Japanese woodcuts and the color and the sun of Japan, and he hoped he could find it in the south of France. So he spent a total of two years in Paris, just three months working in these northwestern suburbs, um, creating 40 paintings and drawings during his three months there. And he leaves those works in his brother Theo's apartment. I'm sure Theo was thankful for that. Oh, I'm sure he was. <laughs> Finally, marking the end of this period, in 1891, Seurat dies of a sudden illness at the young age of 31. I think this is best wrapped up by um, a quote from Camille Pissarro, the artist Camille Pissarro, who attended the funeral and later wrote to his son Lucien um, to paraphrase him. He said something along the lines of, you're right, I think pointillism is finished. But Seurat really did, really contributed something great that will have lasting effects on the art world. And I think he was right. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, the exhibition is um, presented in a very innovative design. And we were so grateful to work with our exhibition designer, Barbara Materia, uh, on it. It is... Um, is fresh and stimulating in ways that we hope you will appreciate. Um, this is an isometric view allowing you to see into uh, the Regenstein Gallery. What really uh, impressed us about Barbara's proposal is that she said she wanted to enhance the relationships between objects and the vi visitor. And in doing so, she really thought broadly about what kind of experience she wanted the visitor to have. So in creating the gallery, the in architectural intervention that shapes the galleries inside, she was thinking about artists like Richard Serra, who's beautiful uh, but also monumental core 10 sculptures really sculpt the visitor's space and his and hers experience um, in it. And then there is also a hyper-local source of inspiration, our own Ellsworth Kelly Chicago panels visible in the Rice Building just outside of our exhibition galleries. And he, you, Barbara used these uh, panels to inspire the shape of the individual galleries, which are not uniform in any way. All eight of them are of vastly different shapes and sizes, but they are geometric. And I think she is seeking to create new relationships between the visitor and the space, between the visitor and objects, between objects uh, together. Um, and so the design itself is terribly innovative and I think appropriate for these avant-garde artists. Another very important consideration is the choice of color to paint the gallery walls. We are very happy to present a variety of works um, of different medium and different um, color palettes, but we have to keep in mind while we want to create a certain mood or ambiance, we have to make each work really show at its best. We want to put, we really thought very carefully so that we could, would have a tone that did not outshine the works, I should say. We drew inspiration from the fact that these artists were going out in the summer, so working along the Seine, so blues to represent the water or perhaps a green to represent the parks and the lush greenery that they may have, that, that, de that they definitely <laughs> encountered uh, in their travels in the suburbs. And ultimately we sided with, we decided to go with the greens. We tried a couple of different options with various amounts of blues or yellows, more earth tones, a little more vibrant. And we 
settled on, or really selected, I should say, um, this color here, New Retro. Great name, by the way. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> Spunky. So we applied the new retro color on the constructed walls within the space. These are This is to help differentiate from the existing Regenstein walls, which you see here in a charcoal gray color called Deep Space. These, the separation between the colors helps to also distinguish between the timeline on the Deep Space gray Regenstein walls, uh, which helps to sort of guide visitors through the exhibition and also provides a, um, a foundation for the timeline, so providing that, that um, chronological uh, narrative. And then the new retro serves to really offset the galleries from, from, that, um, from the timeline and the existing walls. So, I think we came up with a combination that feels very sophisticated, really, as, as I mentioned, shows the works in a beautiful light, regardless of tone or material. And I think we're very pleased with it. We are. It's such an elegant com uh, yeah. com combination. Um, and, and one last comment about this design. Um, you'll notice both in the isometric view, but when you're in the galleries itself, that the designer really wanted to take you on a journey. So you go in and out of these galleries, you turn the corner and you see views. There are windows cut out through some of the walls. So you can see through to other galleries. And then halfway through the exhibition, the direction changes. And instead of going in and out, you are going en suite through these galleries. It's as if you are walking along the Seine. You taking a, a walk and exploring and going on your own journey, which I find entirely appropriate for this uh, exhibition concept. Now, we've been working on this project for three years now, Jenna. And um, Jenna, I have to say, has been a fantastic companion on this journey. Um, her sense of organization is beyond compare, and she kept me on deadline for each deliverable for this project. Thank you. <laughs> as magical as you are, there are some things that are even out of your control, I have to say. I do try. I do try. But. Um, and so we talk about a few of the unexpected surprises yeah, in the absolutely. last few years. Okay. Um, well, the first is the one that uh, we just can't stop talking about, which is the pandemic. We came to this project at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, while we all, I think, were surprised by how much we were able to do via Zoom and working remotely, um, there is something about looking at works of art, assessing condition, looking at frames, that really has to be done in person. Um, so we had to rely heavily on our lending partners to send us photos. They had to go into storage, snap photos of frames that otherwise we would have just looked at in person and sent them to us. So our lenders were very generous with their time and their efforts. Um, and this also carried over into the exhibition catalog, the front and back covers of which you see on the screen. Um, unfortunately, all of our meetings for the catalog were over Zoom. Uh, we had contributors in Amsterdam, Paris, Rouen, Edinburgh, Chicago. I think that's it. Um, and there are still some of them that I have not met in person, but boy, did we produce a gorgeous catalog all done over Zoom. So um, I hope at some point I will meet them all, but we managed to make it through the pandemic portion of these surprises, I think in a very, um, in a decent way. Yeah. Our next surprise was that um, we had to locate a lot of these works. We have 75 works total in the exhibition, 23 of which are from private collections, from 15 uh, different private collections across the globe. Working with private collections can be a little difficult in that you may not know where they are. So we rely really heavily on recent exhibition histories, uh, any provenance history um, that helps us, or recent sales that helps us kind of locate who may know um, the current owner. Uh, I have to admit, this is probably my favorite part of the research process. I, my, my partner calls me an art detective. He thinks it's the coolest thing. <laughs> we need to get you a little badge. I, and a hat too. Uh, <laughs> um, so, 
sometimes this also means that we're relying really heavily on our colleagues, um, particularly at Christie's and Sotheby's. So we're very thankful to them for sort of leading us in the direction um, of being able to pass along letters to the owners requesting these works and assisting in communication. Um, so we're very thankful for that and also very happy to be able to pre present private collection works like the one you see on the screen now. Um, and then there are certain things that are just simply out of your control in terms of, um, well, I suppose we just say life. Um, we were quite excited to be able to bring together two full triptychs um, for this exhibition. And um, geopolitical tensions got in the way of reuniting the second triptych. Um, and this is entirely disappointing because it has nothing to do with the quality of the exhibition concept, uh, nor does it have anything to do with the reputation of the Art Institute or the Van Gogh Museum. Um, it's, I suppose we might call it an act of God. It's just something that happens. So that was a relatively recent development, and it is sorely disappointing because it would have been the first time that the Grand Jatte triptych was reunited since 1896 when it was shown with the dealer Ambrose Vollard. So maybe one day uh, we will succeed. Exactly. Yeah. The next time we do the show, we'll bring these uh, paintings together. <laughs> And as we wrap up, we want to talk about what we did accomplish with the show, what it contributes, because after all, Van Gogh, not an unfamiliar artist, lots of exhibitions, lots of publications about him. Um, what did we manage to do with this exhibition? In several instances, we were able to identify new sites. Uh, for example, with the painting by Van Gogh from the Guggenheim on the left, we knew that it represented a, an underpass in Onier, um, but we were never able to identify where that underpass was. But through looking at black and white postcards, to which Jenna already alluded, we were able to locate that underpass on the Quai d'Onier in the suburb of Onier itself. And in particular, uh, the kind of cinching factor for that was the chimneys above the underpass, which are exactly the chimneys on the house um, in the postcard. So while this is a small contribution to the historiography of this painting, it's an important one. Um, also, there were paintings that were thought to represent parks in Onier, which are um, now identified as parks on the Grand Jatte. We are always are also very happy to introduce our audiences to less familiar artists. Um, we, as Jacqueline mentioned, everyone knows and loves Van Gogh and Seurat certainly uh, has a special place uh, in our hearts at the Art Institute. Um, so we're happy to really introduce the contributions of Emile Bernard. Bernard was a close friend of Van Gogh despite their, their age difference. They often painted together, they painted a, a portrait, they each painted a separate portrait uh, of a mutual friend together in um, Bernard's uh, studio in the garden, uh, in his family's garden. And uh, they maintained a very rigorous correspondence. So we know a lot about um, Van Gogh's opinions about not just art um, and politics and things like that, but things as simple as, does an artist actually need to study in a studio to be an artist or can they just sort of set off and do their own thing? We're also happy to introduce, uh, introduce, perhaps for the first time, Charles Langrand. As Jacqueline mentioned, he was a very heavy participant in exhibitions. He was well known. He was exhibiting uh, next to very large names during his time. And he was also a very close friend of Seurat, leading to them painting together on the island of the Grand Jatte in 1888. We know a lot about these artists and this period in particular because while he was working, while he was teaching in Paris during the school year, Angrand was writing letters back to his family in northern France. And then when he eventually leaves Paris uh, in the 1890s, he's still writing letters and corresponding with artists working in, in Paris and thereabouts. So he's uh, he certainly is a, a name that we're happy to in include and to, to introduce to everyone will now become a household name, I'm sure. I hope so. Yes. 
Um, and finally, I think, or I hope that we pull back a bit uh, the curtain on Van Gogh's creative development. Um, you see two paintings on the screen, which are actually hung side by side in the exhibition. Um, demonstrating how rapidly his style evolves during this period. The one on the left is from 1886, and the one on the right, full of color and divided brushstrokes, even points, taking on the pointillist uh, character here, um, in 1887. So rapid was his devouring of these avant-garde styles. And so I think um, this exhibition not only wants to show how he evolves as an artist, but also by placing him in the context of these other four, it reinforces how important creative exchange is with other artists, both um, conversations, um, painting together, and also just um, uh, exploring different opportunities in terms of style and technique. So um, we all know that Van Gogh was not sui generis. He did not um, spring from the ground being the painter of Starry Night, but we understand a bit more how he became that artist when he moved to Arles in 1888. So we hope you enjoy the exhibition, and um, we hope that you return several times over the course of the summer.